So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome back Milton Jara, who will give the third of his lectures on entropy methods for Markov chains. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And as always, I'm really happy to see that everybody is uh, it's, it's still uh, cheerful and alive and uh, happy to, 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 to hear my, uh, my third lecture. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, today I, I, I need to do some proofs. Okay, so uh, it's probably not, it's not going to be so easy going as uh, last time. But uh, well, let's see how it goes. Okay, so last time. Okay, so what I did last time was to introduce this uh, reaction diffusion model as an example of intrinsic and particle systems with a um, interesting behavior because it's a, it's a non equilibrium Markov chain in the sense that uh, the, the stationary measure is uh, some sort of complicated uh, measure to which we don't have direct access. Okay, so, uh, so it's what we call a non equilibrium stationary state. Um, and, and the idea is try to get information about uh, this. Uh, this chain and hopefully about the, also its invariant measure out of uh, these uh, hydrodynamic limit techniques that allow us to show that um, in some sense, the dynamics of the process is well approximated by the solution of a partial differential equation, okay? We made some simplifications to make this position uh, simpler, more easy going, but, um, this strategy I'm proposing here is quite general, can be applied to in various different contexts. So uh, I, I, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a good idea to take a look at it in a more uh, careful way. Okay, so the, the, the starting point is the, what is called the Yaus inequality, which is this inequality there that relates the relative entropy of the law of our Markov chain with respect to a uh, uh, chosen C, uh, family of reference measures nu t with uh, two terms. One that uh, I, I like to call it uh, an energy term, which is negative and is related to this uh, uh, quadratic operator associated to the generator of the, of the chain, the so-called carré du champ. And a second term, which uh, I like to call it entropy production term, which is uh, something that might be positive, might be negative, but it, it is present there because actually our reference measures are not the, 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 the exact loss of the Markov chain we are looking at, okay? So, uh, so last time I made some computations and I, I wrote this FT, uh, this formula here. So uh, who, were, who was asking about the, where did the number two go? Uh, you were asking about the number two there, right? So the thing is that here I'm, so, I'm uh, making the sum over uh, an ordered uh, okay. couple. So I'm not summing twice on, on X and Y. That's why the, the, the number two disappeared. Um, and we have this, uh, this function here, which is uh, it's, it's something quadratic in a sense. And, um, I want to convince you that having something quadratic is better than having something linear, okay? So it's also related with what the, uh, Henry was talking uh, about today, about this, uh, somehow this uh, Fock uh, space computation, et cetera. But uh, you, here we won't see really the, the, the connection in a very concrete way, okay? Um, so let me introduce a, a notation, let me call, uh, sigma x bar, this uh, random variable sigma x minus rho t. So this, uh, no, notice that this, 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 this is not a, a real centering in the sense that rho t is not the expectation of sigma x with respect to the law of the process. It is the expectation of sigma x with respect to the reference measure. Okay, so we believe that it's a good approximation for the expectation, but maybe it's not exactly the expectation. And another thing that uh, uh, keep, you have to keep in mind is that, that the, 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 this centering changes with time, okay? It's not the same for any time t because we're changing the measure, okay? And, and I'm not putting that uh, explicitly into the notation because from now on, what we're going to do is that uh, I'm going to say, okay, you know, uh, 
somehow probability play its role up to here. And from now on, what I'm going to do is a little bit of analysis. So I'm going to treat this, uh, this formula here as, a, as, an, as an analytical formula. So in PDEs, usually when people arrive here, they say, okay, let's forget about that, uh, the fact that FT is uh, the solution of some equation. Let's now just assume that FT is a function. And let's try to bound the integral, the entropy production term by the energy. But uh, let's try to find, find a bounds that work or are true for all functions F. Maybe because of some additional reason, you have some information about the function F and you can say, okay, let's find, uh, 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 let's try to bound this term for all functions F satisfying this condition, okay? Here, since we are talking about general Markov chains, I don't really have any information about F. So what we are going to do now is to bound the, the, the integral by the, the energy term, uh, forgetting completely about the, the, the fact that the function FT depends on time and just using that this, this function F is a density. The only thing that we are going to use now is that this function is a density, okay? So, so what is the, uh, I'm going to try to do today is to going to regularize this function F, uh, capital FT. So let me just write here so you can remember what the function capital F was. So this function capital FT, it's equal to, so let me call it alpha, this constant that my, uh, uh, that is in front of everything. It was lambda divided by d rho t, but let me just call it alpha. So we have one layer less of, uh, of notation. And let me immediately write this in the following way. So let me write ft like this. Okay, so remember that the sum is over neighbors. Okay, so one simple way to parameterize all neighbors on the lattice is just to uh, um, take the canonical basis and take the sum over the base point and all the neighbors into the, let's say, the, the, the positive octant. Okay, so that's the function F. And now we're going to introduce a mesoscopic scale L. Okay, that is, so, so the idea now is that uh, I want to somehow replace this local function here by a function of the density of particles over a region of size L. And uh, the, the game is try to take the biggest L possible. So we are kind of, uh, in a way we, we are going to, I, I call that regularizing the function F. And, uh, and of course, uh, the largest the L is, the most difficult is to regularize the function F. Uh, but the better it will be for our purposes later on, okay? So now I need to introduce a little bit of uh, notation so we can do that. Um, so I'm going to call all L plus the positive octant of size L, okay? So uh, what, what is the octant is uh, the is this, uh, sector of the, of the space on which, of the vector space of, of the ZD or RD on which all the components on my vector are non-negative. And among them, I'm, all, I, I, I'm taking only the ones that also have uh, components smaller than or equal to L minus one, okay? So since I'm going from zero, starting from zero, I go up to L minus one to have something of size L. So this is a, this is a, a, a it, 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 it's a cube with, a, with one of the vertices at zero and all of the other vertices at, at the, uh, have such that all of the other vertices have positive, uh, non-negative uh, entries, okay? So that's the positive orthant of size L. So in, in, so in the case of R2 or Z2, this is OL plus. And, the, and like this is minus one, no? And, the, and let me call P L of Z, the uniform measure on this positive orthon, okay? Um, 
I don't know if you uh, have observed this at some point. Also, Henry was saying, you know, uh, let me take instead of thinking uh, averages like a uh, uniform average over uh, uh, a box of size uh, gamma minus one. Let me do it with a smooth uh, function because it's it's nicer. Okay. So here I'm going to do a little bit of the same. I don't know if you knew about this fact, but uh, something really unpleasant about the, the taking the uniform measure, the uh, taking uh, uh, the average with a uniform measure, is that the uniform measure is not a positive definite kernel. Namely, if you take the, 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 the Fourier transform of, uh, of PL of Z, or the Fourier series here is discrete, no? Well, uh, the coefficients are, uh, are oscillating, right? And from the point of view of averaging, it's really, really nice to have positive definite uh, kernels because uh, they, they behave much better than just a simple kernel. Uh, in order to do that, in order to have that, uh, one very simple way to, to achieve it is just take the, the uniform measure and take the convolution of the uniform measure with itself. If you take the convolution of the uniform measure with itself, what you get is some sort of pyramid, no? So you, you get a triangle in, in 1D. In, I think it's, a, it's, it's some sort of pyramid in, in, in 2D. Uh, uh, maybe, yeah, I think. And, um, and that, that kernel is much better because it's positive definite. Okay, so one of the properties of positive definite uh, kernels is that, uh, uh, for example, the, the Fourier transform has positive coefficients. And this is obvious for here because, of course, the, the Fourier transform is, 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 the, is the Fourier transform of PL squared, so it has to have a positive coefficients. Okay, so uh, this, this is just to tell you that it's, it's never a bad idea to regularize the, the, the way in which you take averages because um, it, 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 the, the, the usual uniform way is not the, it has some unpleasant uh, properties that maybe one wants to avoid, okay? So I'm going to use this probability measure QL, which is supported in the, in the orthant of size 12 minus one in order to make averages, okay? Just because it's more, uh, it's going to be more convenient, it has better properties, okay? So well, one observation is that all these objects, they have canonical definitions in lambda n. No? Actually, the particle system we're looking at uh, lives on, a, on the lattice with periodic boundary conditions. And if n is much bigger than L, then all these objects just have one canonical uh, definition in, a, in lambda L that, 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 uh, that um, uh, goes well with the, with the canonical projection. Okay, so now I'm going to define uh, sigma x bar L as the mesoscopic average. Okay, this this average over a region that I was telling, telling about, and I'm, I'm going to define it with Q instead of, uh, of, uh, of P because it has, it's going to have slightly better properties when we look at it. Okay, so this is uh, this is the way I'm going to uh, on which I'm going to take averages, and it's not complete. It's, it's, it's not essential to do that at the end of the day, but uh, in a um, in a first draft that we have of our uh, works on it, it was uh, really important to have this uh, mesoscopic average. But uh, nowadays, actually, it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, so, and uh, what is your our aim? is to replace this function ft by this other function that I'm going to call ftl, okay? So to introduce an average on at least one of the components of, uh, of, this, uh, of this product, x, uh, sigma x, sigma, uh, sigma y, okay? And, uh, and if one, one does that, the idea is to control the error, I mean, the, the difference between uh, this integral, so, I want to basically say that this f is any density f, and mu is uh, is any product measure. 
not necessarily new to you, but uh, uh, and, and, and I want to say that this is less or equal than maybe a, a, a constant times this. This is something that, this is ideally what we want to do, okay? And of course, uh, usually things don't go the way we planned. So the, this, it's very likely that we will have an error when we do that, okay? And then uh, of course, the, the question is, can we make the error small? And probably that has something to do with the size of the mesoscopic uh, variable L that I'm defining here. Okay, so, well, when one does the difference between FT and FTL, uh, one gets this difference between the, the occupation variable at one side, so what happens at what side, and the average over, the, over, over, the, over this box of size L. In the definition of the FL, so the first uh, sigma is not the, the mesoscopic average. No. It's just the center, okay, only yeah. the second one. Yeah, there, okay. actually here you, uh, there is a trick no, that you can do. Uh, this is something I, I'm going to do at the last step, is that uh, since Q is P, uh, is the, um, is PL, uh, start PL, you can pass PL to the other side of the sum. So this is, this, this is really uh, the average over the two guys. This is basically how we discovered that the QL was the, the nice guy. Okay, no, alpha depends on T, yes. So the question online is the fact that alpha does not depend on T is true for some reason, question mark. <laughs> yeah, no, no, the, it, 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 it's not true because it does not. It, it does depend on T, no? It's, it's, it's just that uh, I'm not putting T in, in the notation a little bit by purpose because the arguments that we are going to uh, develop here, they are not time dependent in, sense, in a sense. They're just uh, static arguments in a sense, okay? So the, the time dependence of the chain was replaced by this energy in this situation, okay? So this is just preparation to try to, to, to bound these guys. So you see that, um, so now I, I got this difference, no? So now the trick, this is, um, okay, so I want to, I have this difference here and somehow I want to express it as something local because this is, this is local and this is global. And I would like to express this as a sum of local terms somehow, okay? And the way to do that is with um, maybe not optimal exactly, but let's call it uh, with ideas from optimal transport, okay? So the idea is that uh, I want to transport this unit mass here and spread it to the whole box OL in some efficient way, okay? And, um, and in order to do that, I need to introduce the concept of flow, okay? So what is a flow? So we have here the lattice. And a flow is just, an, uh, it's just something which is defined here on the edges of my lattice, okay? And so it's a function from the oriented edges of the lattice to the real numbers with the property that if you go around, uh, no, not necessary. Uh, no, without the property. So with the property that uh, if you go the, in this way, the, the value when you pass this way is minus the value when you pass to the, uh, in the other way. Okay, that's that's going. That's what I'm going to call a flow. So it's a, it's a it's it's a function that associates a number to each one of the uh, of the edges of my lattice, and the rule is that when I pass through an edge and then come back. I just change the sign, okay? So this is, uh, this is the definition of, of, this is one I'm going to call a flow. So for example, what people call a conservative flow is one that you go around and get zero. And now I'm going to say that a flow connects the measure mu and nu. Let me see, maybe, maybe I should write this 
this in another way, because it's actually not exactly, it's not something exactly commutative because it's a, if a flow connects mu to nu, then minus the flow connects nu to mu. Okay, so a flow connects the measure mu to nu if this happens, okay? So what is in the sum is what is outwatched from point X by the flow. And what is on the right is the difference, no? So you see that, that uh, this flow is somehow, uh, you have one measure and you want to, uh, you have N boxes at one side and you, you, and you, and, 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 and you are the mailer and you want to put it on the, on, on, on the respective places. And, and then you have to decide how to do that, no? So, well, you pick all the boxes and put it here, or maybe you take half of the boxes, put it here, the other half you transport there, and you go like that. You define a strategy. This flow tells you this strategy. How, but what are the local instructions that at the end will put all boxes in the respective places? Well, here the boxes are, uh, are, uh, are all equal, so uh, that's why you have just one measure, but uh, well, this is what actually we need, okay? So the idea is that uh, I want to define a flow that connects this guy with the unit measure at site X with the measure QL, okay? Because that will give me a strategy about how to perform this average. So, well, and, and, and ah, okay, yeah, that's just, uh, that's just uh, one remark is that this concept of flow, of course, is well defined on any graph, okay? So if you want to do, uh, this thing in a, in, in, in a graph, which is not a, a lattice-like, is not a problem. You just, you just can do the same thing. Yes? Um, so, uh, sorry, let me see if I'm, I'm thinking of this flow correctly. So you start with a measure mu and you have some, some mass at a point X and your flow is how you move it to your neighbors. Yeah. Right, you just push it. And then the idea is it's a flow connecting the two measures. If when you're done pushing, you see new as yeah, your exactly. measure. Okay, perfect, great. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I was also wondering this uh, uh, sigma bar, sigma bar L, they're not made, uh, uh, you can meet also sign, sign measures or probability measures or positive measures. Yeah, well, you Functions. can do, yeah, yeah, you can do, you can do that. But I, I, I actually, what happens here is that uh, this is something maybe I, I forgot to, forgot to tell you is that, uh, so if a flow connects the measure mu to nu, then it's uh, uh, then then uh, there is um, the divergence theorem is true. Okay, so it means that you can actually also connect the expectation with respect to mu with the expectation with respect to mu. Yeah, because here here this is not this these are not exactly measures as you said. No, the, uh, this is this, this is actually the expectation of the field sigma bar with respect to the, to the unit measure. And this guy here is the expectation of the field sigma bar with respect to the measure mu. So yeah, so this is something I didn't write, but maybe I should write it. Uh, uh, what, you, what, what, I'm, what I meant here is the divergence theorem. So what the divergence theorem says, says something of the following form that, uh, so this is uh, what we are going to use here, okay? Because uh, the function f is this guy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sigma bar, and uh, we are integrating sigma bar with respect to the atomic measure, and here we are integrating sigma bar with respect to the spread out measure. Thank you for your for your comment. Okay, so now, okay, so this is something that we call the the flow lemma. Okay, so what is the flow lemma? The flow lemma tells you that. Um, there exists a flow which is kind of optimal up to constant, okay? So if you're really pushing for taking the best possible flow, the best possible flow has these three, proper, three proper, uh, properties here. And well, you have to, uh, you have to um, speak about the cost of the flow, okay? So what people usually do is that uh, they define the cost of a flow as some 
some norm, of like for example, B, no? That's the L2 norm of the flow. And that's something very popular that people do is that they say, okay, the L2 norm of the flow is the cost of the flow. And I, I want to, my, my optimal transport problem is find the flow with the lowest cost, possible cost, okay? This is, actually, this is something that you can actually do with probability because uh, uh, what, what, what this is related to uh, harmonic functions and to green functions and random walks. So you can use random walks to actually find the, the optimal uh, flow in this situation. Okay, and so, but, but um, here I, 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 um, I'm not pursuing to take the, um, the optimal flow. One which is near optimal is going to be good enough, okay? So the flow lemma says that there exists a constant that not depend on any, does not depend on L, such that we can connect P0. So I'm, to, I'm calling P0 to, this, to the unit mass at zero, right? Actually, it coincides with the definitions we did before. So uh, maybe with the zero above, uh, maybe, uh, maybe not zero, but one actually. So the single mass at the origin with the, with the measure QL such that these three properties happen. So the first thing is that you never get out of the, of the box, okay? So you don't go uh, too far outside. Uh, the second one is that the L2 norm of the flow is uh, small enough, okay? So it's small that GDL, which is this GD constant there is what, what I wrote there. So uh, if, I, if I write these numbers there, L in dimension one, log L in dimension two, and one in dimension three, and I'm talking about boxes of size L, you may or may not recognize that as the, green function of the random walk at zero, which is also equal to the L2 norm of the green function. Yes? Um, oh yeah, you said that the flow file is optimal up to a constant. Yeah. Yeah, so, so for the opti optimality, optimality, so is it optimal to, um, to the, both the condition B and condition C, or is it optimal with both conditions? Yeah. So, okay, so yeah. it's optimal uh, with condition B and C is a, let's say it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a bonus condition. Huh, it's, 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 it's true for the, for the, for, for the flow I, I'm going to construct, and it's also true for the optimal flow, but uh, it's not related to the, to the fact that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so. So you can see with the green function of the random work on the, on, on the square or, or on the cube, you can construct this flow, okay? But it's not very explicit. So, and, uh, and then it's difficult to, to, to verify C, but I also find something which is, in, I, I, I also think about this in a different way. So, okay, we know a lot about the, the green function of the random work on a, on, on a box. But let's say that you don't like boxes and you are more into trees or other type of graphs. We don't know as much as we know for, for the random world here. We, we know little about the random world. So the, 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 the idea is that uh, uh, in this strategy that I'm trying to present to you, it doesn't matter that you don't get the, the, the optimal flow. If you get some flow that is good enough, it's okay. And sometimes you can, I mean, you can just construct the flow because you can, you know, you go there and you put the, uh, you, you play with your masses a little bit and you discover a nice flow that it, it serves to your purposes. Okay, so let me just show you how to prove this flow lemma very quickly. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to do all the details because it's not really. The point, uh, so, so let me do it, explain to you how you, how we, we do it on the square, okay? On the square lattice. Okay, so I'm going to do it the other way around. So flows has a, a very nice property, a, 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 a abelian properties that uh, if, uh, if, um, if you have a, 
a flow that goes from mu1 to mu2, and then another flow that goes from mu2 to mu t. Then the sum of the flows goes from mu1 to mu3. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's something nice. Also, it means that uh, if you want to go from P1 to QL, something that you can do is, go, is you can go from P1 to PL. Then you go from PL to QL just by uh, convolution. If you take the convolution of your flow, it will, it will go from the convolution to the other guy. Uh, so I'm going to explain you how to go from P1 to PL. But actually, what I'm going to explain you is how to go from PL to PL minus one. Okay, because of course, if you have a flow that goes from mu to nu, then minus the flow goes from nu to mu. So we have here our mass. And how do we do that? Okay, so the first thing we do is that here we have mass one over L squared, right? And then we push this mass in this direction in the only possible way. Half of the mass in that direction, half of the mass is in this other direction, okay? So now after doing that, here I have mass one over L squared plus uh, one over two L squared times L minus one, something like that, no? So I take this mass here and I push it in this direction in such a way that I, uh, I, I, I leave uniform mass here. And I do that in all, this, in, in all the directions. And what happens is that this flow connects PL to PL minus one. Then you do it again. You connect PL minus one to PL minus two. You do it again. And again, and again, and again, and you get a flow that goes from the uniform on the square to the to the corner of the square, and and that's the flow of the lemma. Okay, so no green functions, no no sophisticated theory, and we got a constant away of the optimal flow. Okay, and. I, I wanted to stress this point because, of course, one could we, we could have done it in a more uh, sophisticated way. No, say okay, let's do optimal transport. But in this way, you see that uh, in your particular situation, maybe you you you, you, don't, you cannot solve the optimal problem, but you can present something that you believe is good enough, and that it, it's also okay. Okay, so this is the flow lemma, and we and oh, well. Also, you, you have to verify C. C is uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, annoying, but it's true. Uh, and, um, and once you have this flow lemma, uh, we can go back to the, the thing that we wanted to bound. No? We want to bound FT minus FTL, okay? But this is all, all of this is just pre-processing, okay? Try to rewrite. This difference, which is which involves um, the difference between something which is local with something which is mesoscopic, in terms of local things. Okay, so this is some sort of a integration by parts lemma uh, in in the discrete case. And well, you write it. So now what what I did here is that I I, I wrote this difference. Now I use this divergence theorem to rewrite the difference between the, the, the guy at one point and the spread out guy as difference between neighbors, okay? As small gradients. And the pay, the, the cost that you have to pay is to put the flow there. And the, the, this flow makes the works very, very uh, efficiently. And, uh, and then you rearrange things and you see that with this thing here, you can rewrite the, this difference there as a, a, a gradient, right? A something that looks like a gradient at least, times a function. And this function there is what I call the renormalized function. Okay? So you can reformulate all this thing here in fancy terms with the, uh, uh, using renormalization. 
in the, the following sense, you can think, okay, this sigma bar is a field, okay, that is defined on X. And now I want to make average of it. And the, the cost to, to, to make, um, uh, to take averages of this field is that now I get a renormalized field times a gradient. So this is, this is well, that's why we call this renormalization operator because it's, 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 it's looked like that. It's like a, you are making an, an operation in, in, in your, the space of fields and you get a new field, which is, uh, which, which is another, no? it's a function of X. No? So you start with this uh, with sigma bar and now you get R of sigma bar. And uh, well, there, there are also the, well, there are the directions, no? so, but, uh, but you get that sum and you see uh, there is an average there. Okay, so we're replacing F by an average and the error that we are committing uh, uh, in, on doing that, and that, uh, that replacement is also an average. So we are really renormalizing things. Okay, so this is just pre-processing to uh, now put uh, what we really want to do. So just to remind you what is, is there, what we want to do is to, what we want to estimate the, the integral of that guy there. Uh, so we, separ we separate this integral in two parts, the FL, time, uh, the, the, the renormalized uh, capital F and the difference. And the idea is that the renormalized capital F, we are going to estimate it by entropy arguments. And the, uh, the other guy, the, the local guy, we are going to estimate it by energy, meaning we are going to use the Carré du Champ thing. And now, uh, well, now we put the function f. Now that we have this nice gradient there, the, the trick is that we can pass the gradient to the function f. And now this starts to look like the Carré du Champ because in the Carré du Champ, well, uh, okay, so there is, yeah, in, in, in the next slide, I'm going to write the Carré du Champ, but I, I want to, maybe I, I write it here before they put it on the slides because that's, uh, you will see the, how it goes. So I, I, I gave you at the, at the first lecture, I think, a formula for the Carré du Champ. It's something completely explicit that you can compute. So this guy, Okay, uh, well, here I'm going to just replace the, the, what is inside of the integral. I'm not, I'm not doing anything with the integral. So there are two terms. There is the exclusion part and there is the reaction part. Okay, so you see in this exclusion part, there is this difference, which is also there. This guy here, what people usually do is that they write it at this. So this is the trick people use. Uh, this trick is pretty old. So this is, this trick was already presented in the in this uh, papers by Vala and Yao and hydrodynamic limits, but actually goes back to maybe uh, okay. The, the oldest reference I know where this where this trick is used is is, is Nash actually the, this, the the famous paper about the the regularity of parabolic equations and the. And probably uh, it's older than that. Well, you can write it like this. And if you write it like this, you see that there we are, we are in good shape because we can, we can try to estimate that guy there by, by this guy here. Okay. So, and here, when you do this, uh, the, when you pass the derivative to the other side, uh, it's, it, it comes really in handy that we're using the Bernoulli product measure because uh, if, the Bernoulli product measure is invariant and this, this, this exchange of sites. Otherwise, we will have to put there a Jacobian that might, uh, that could, uh, that, and that, that will make things more complicated. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing this in this simplified level, because um, if, you, if you want to treat the, the general case, there will be more terms in this expression. Okay, so this is the, the expression for the Carré du Champ. So there are two terms, one that comes from the, from the exclusion part of the dynamics, and there is another one that comes from the reaction part of the dynamics. So I'm going to call, I'm going to use this notation nabla, which is pretty much natural to, uh, to, the, to denote these differences. Um, 
And now we have this lemma. So this lemma is very easy to prove. It's, it's just Cauchy-Schwarz, no? It's weighted Cauchy-Schwarz. So you use the, the uh, beta as the weight. And there should be a beta over two and one over two beta. But what happens is that uh, you also have to write this gradient, no? This, this, um, you have to do this, no? So you have to write uh, this difference, f of sigma xy minus f of sigma as the difference of the square roots times the sum of the square roots. OK? You do that, and then you do Cauchy-Schwarz using one of the guys is this guy here, and the other guy is g times this guy here. And, um, and then you get that, and then, then, then the, this, this, this number two goes away because actually you get the square of this guy, and you're going to estimate the square of the sum by the twi uh, two times, uh, twice the, 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 the sum of the squares. And then you have two terms. So that gives you a four that cancels the, the both, both the, the numbers. So it doesn't really matter. It's just a constant. And, uh, and, and if, you, if you use this dilemma, then you get the bound that you want, right? Because we expressed ft as a sum of something times this little gradient. We pass the gradient to the, to, to the density f, and now we do the, the Cauchy Schwarz, and we get magically, we get the Carré du Champ there. Remember that the Carré du Champ uh, is multiplied by n squared. So what, going, what I'm doing here is to take beta equals to n squared divided by two. That amounts to have a n over two at the other side. So this is where we win, okay? Because it magically appears a one over n squared at the other side. So th that guy there, the, the, the renormalized operator, is not really an average because it doesn't have, uh, I'm not divided by the size of the box L, right? So remember the definition of the R? What is the definition of R? It's there. So you see, there is a sum there. The sum is, I, I wrote it as a sum over lambda n, but it's actually a, a sum over the, the orthant because the flow is zero outside the orthon. So if you, if you divide by something that depends on L, you get an average. It's, it, it's, you don't have to divide by one over L to the D because there is the, the flow there and the flow is not uniform. So that depends on that, 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 that's going to depend a little bit on dimension. So the normalization is not going to be L to the D, it's going to be actually L to the D minus two. Ah. Uh, but um, that's the renormalization operator. So you need a factor to make it uh, uh, an average. And you get the factor from this computation because you get an n squared there. So now what we're going to do is that we're going to choose L in such a way that L divided by, uh, in such a way that one over n squared is exactly the normalizing factor for the renormalization guy there for the renormalized uh, average that we have there, OK? So let me write, uh, let, me call, let, let me call that guy. Let me give it a name to that guy. So that's a name. And uh, so what we show now, so this is the uh, summarizing what all the computations we've done up to now, we have proved that uh, the, the derivative of the entropy is smaller or equal that something still uh, so I put one half because maybe later one could need uh, a little bit more of energy to do more averages. Okay, so this is something that, that's that's the the basis of this renormalization business. No, so maybe with this scheme you get to a scale L, which is not enough. But then what you do? You do it again. No, and then you take you 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 take another. Uh, piece of the of the energy and well that uh, if uh, if we're lucky if, if we if we really believe in what we're doing at the end of the day you get what you want okay so can you say again what the 
What? So, yeah, one is means exclusion and the other one means reaction. Yeah. So it's that, uh, so we haven't touched the reaction yet. Yeah. Uh, only the exclusion. So it, this means that you don't really need the reaction term to perform all of this. So, so this, all, everything I've seen up to here also works for conservative systems. So the, the reaction part hasn't been used at all. Um, and then you have these two terms. And you see that in these two terms, so this is really much better than before, right? Because I used just a little bit of the, of the, um, of the energy. And now instead of having an average uh, to compute the expectation of a sum of local functions, now I have averages. Right, both functions FTL and RTL, they have averages. Okay, so uh, a little bit of pre-processing. So FTL, as I was telling you, can be written in a, as, as a product of two averages. Right? Just because this QL that was using there uh, is it's, it's the square of the PL. You now you can pass the PL to the other side, and and we get these averages. You no, know, in which uh, uh, so in, in in one you take the the average over the, the positive orthant, and then the other one, you take the average over the negative orthant. Yes, just because of, of how these uh, uh, convolutions work. Okay, so there are two different averages over, over two different regions. And that's also very good. The, these two averages actually are averaging different regions of space, which means that these averages are independent. Okay, so once you've done that, now, as I was telling you, so it's, it's entropy time. So energy was used to regularize the function to which we want to compute the, the, the expectation. And now we are going to use entropy. Entropy works well with global variables. Because here, what you have to think about is that I had two measures that are close in entropy. In this, uh, in this, uh, in 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 this uh, space of uh, configurations of particles, so it's a it's it's a product space, right? And I have these two measures. One of them is product. The other one we don't know yet what what it is. And in principle, we want uh, we have in our mind that the entropy between these two is not too big. That not that is not good enough to tell you that in a small region. The, the 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 conditional laws are close, but it's really good to tell you that if I take a small region and an average over the whole thing, then I will get two things that are very close. Uh, so well, well, now we try that. No, so we use so the first thing we do is we use the entropy inequality. So now whether we use the entropy inequality, I I, I showed to you the the other time what this entropy inequality was. So and and now. As you can see, I'm always using these betas as this constant that I'm going to tune afterwards. So, and now you see if if uh, if I can show the idea is to use Gronwald at some point. So I have h prime smaller than a constant times h. So if what I have there, there is an L here which is missing. That is not uh, really a great deal. And this log of uh, 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 this integral, which is there, now is with respect to the product measure. So in principle, we can do it, right? Is as best as one can ask in this situation, right? It's, it's a uniform Bernoulli measure, and I have sums of Bernoullis independent, and I want to compute the uh, exponential moments of that, okay? So this function FL, so let me just do it like this, okay? So this is a function FL. So you see, it's, it's what I call a 2L minus one independent function. What does it mean? It means that if in this sum, I take two sides, which are a distance bigger than 2L minus one, these terms are independent, okay? So it's not a sum of independent random variables, but it's sum of 2L minus one independent random variable. So how do you do that? Uh, how do you take uh, advantage of that? Uh, well, you do, what you do is that uh, you write your sum into 2L minus one to the D sums. 
And in, on each of the sums, there are only independent terms. And, uh, and here you use just a crude holder estimate to separate this, uh, this, 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 this sum into 2L minus 1 to the D independent sums. And now that you have independent sums, you can compute. So, okay, so I don't want to carry this 2L minus 1 everywhere. So I, I'm going to put a constant C and divide by L to the D. So, so this is just holder inequality, just to separate the guys. And now, how many terms do we have n to the d? Okay. So, and they are all the same because uh, the, the measure mu is uniform. They are all the same. So I, I can put instead of the sum, I can put just n to the d, one of the guys. So one of the guys is that one. And, and here we basically won, no? Because so this sigma zero, it's an average over a, blocks, uh, a box of size L. So they're L to the D terms. And it's normalized. So it means that uh, uh, here, in each one of these two terms, I, I'm winning L to the D over two, right? Because they are centered, they satisfy the CLT, so they are approximately Gaussian. But the variance is one over L to the D. And this one over L to the D cancel exactly the L to the D, which is in front of it. So now I have the exponential moment of a product of two Gaussians. That is finite if the constant in front is small enough. Okay, so let's remember that that the, the Gaussian does not the square of the Gaussian does not have exponential moments of all orders, right? But it does have exponential moments of uh, of parameters small enough. Okay, so now what we do is that we take beta there small enough, but notice is small enough, but not dependent on L. So it does not depend on anything here. The only thing on which this beta depends on, it's on the parameter alpha. So I have to take it smaller with respect to alpha, okay? So that's, that's for Gaussians, but um, you, can, may, you may complain that uh, my random variables are nullis are not Gaussian. So uh, then what you do is that uh, you use half the inequality. So half the inequality tells you that actually um, Bernoulli random variables are sub Gaussians. So if they have Gaussian tails. And if they have Gaussian tails, it means that uh, I can bound any integral of any uh, increasing function of these sums of Bernoulli's by the integral with respect to Gaussian with a variance which is uh, just. Uh, a constant times the variance of the Bernoulli's. Okay, that's what Huffington inequality tells you. So, well, you can do that, and uh, it's like so. So, I just to, I just put there to tell you that at this point, operating with the sums of Bernoulli's is the same thing as operating with Gaussian. And so, the consequence is that uh, if beta is smaller equal than beta zero alpha, that exponential moment is smaller than something, for example, e. Okay, just to take the log and take a, uh, and get one instead of two or three. Um, and at the end of the day, what we have proved is that when you integrate this FL, you get the entropy times the constant alpha times ND to divided by LD. Okay, so here, we are, we are, at least from the first part, which is the, the, the FL, we are in good shape. Okay, and then you go and do the same for R. Okay, so maybe I'm not going to bother you with the, all the details for R. The only uh, different thing here is that remember that R of, uh, of sigma bar is not a uniform average. It's an average which is taken with respect to the flow. Therefore, but the inequality uh, works anyway. You have to take the you have to compute the variance of these sums of Bernoulli's, and when you take the variance of the sum of Bernoulli's, what you get is exactly the L two norm of the flow. When you get the L two norm to the of the flow, then now you have to say okay, now I take I need to take beta to beat that guy. And well, you have to and and the parameters here are different. No, you still have the L to the d, but now you have an n squared below. Um, well, again, her dilemma just to to make this point uh, more um, more prominent. So you do the computations at at some point you are going to discover that uh, 
that integral, the, the, the expectation of the, the, the exponential moment of that uh, the, of the renormalized average of the Bernoulli random variables is smaller or equal than that. So you get exactly this parameter GDL, which is the, uh, it was this green function at the origin. Okay. So then you discover that the, the, um, the right beta to consider here is, well, it's that one. And you get an estimate, which is very similar. Uh, I think so yeah, this is here is a small mistake, but it doesn't really matter. So you get the same estimates as before in the part of the, of the entropy, but you, but you get a prefactor. A, a, a prefactor that depends on the mesoscopic scale and has an n squared below. So it's here that we have to choose the mesoscopic scale at which we can go with, this, uh, with these averages, OK? So if you do the computations, then you discover that uh, the best choice of L, of course, it's LD times GDL equals n squared. So in dimension one, that means that L is equal to n if you do the computations. But then, of course, it cannot be equal to n because you cannot take uh, average over a, 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 a box of size 2L minus 1 because then you go around the, the circle. So just to be sure that you don't, you don't go around the circle in this thing, you take n n divided by four, okay? So n divided by two, maybe it's, it's two order lines, so you take n divided by four just to be sure that uh, you don't go around. Uh, so in dimension two, you do the, compu the, you do the computation, and you discover that the mesoscopic scale is n divided by the square root of log of n. And in dimension d bigger than three, you discover that the mesoscopic scale is n to the d minus two. And, and under this choice, you get that bound. So this is the... After all this work, uh, so I, I left there the half of the Carré Duchamp. You can check that uh, uh, using all the energy, that does not really improve anything. Okay? It puts a new constant there. Maybe if you multiply this, that you can divide that constant by two or by something. That's not really um, a, big, uh, a big thing because here in this bound, the, the important things is that are that first, the constant in front of the entropy does not depend on n. So we can actually make the, uh, now we can use uh, the Gronwall, no? Well, here is, call it this Gronwall, it's a little bit overshooting, no? It's just, you can, we can multiply by e to the, to, to the C alpha alpha plus, uh, plus alpha square times t and, 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 and do the integration, no? We can just solve this, uh, this differential inequality, and we are going to get a bound on, 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 on HT. And the, and the bound we are going to get is of order n to the d divided by l to the d, where l is, are those guys there. Okay? So, um, so now we're proving the following theorem. Okay? So this is actually the complete proof of this. Well, I just present to use the complete proof of this theorem here. Okay. Uh, what this theorem said is so there exists a constant C that only depends on the dimension. The entropy is smaller or equal than the initial entropy. So you solve the differential equation for the entropy plus A dn. So this is that, is, is that the A dn is n to the d divided by L to the d. Okay. You have to have that constant when you solve the, the, the guy. And then you have an exponential factor. So this is something that grows exponentially with, uh, with t. And, uh, but it uh, does not depend on N, no, right? So, so if, if, if you are interested, for example, in hydrodynamic limits on which, so in hydrodynamic limits, you are looking at the evolution of this PDE and you're looking at the evolution of this PDE up to a finite time, okay? So you're really looking at finite time intervals. You can take infinite time intervals, but uh, what you're going to say in your hydrodynamic limit is how uh, is, uh, we converge in the topology of convergence in compacts, something like that. And, 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 and there is, uh, you don't expect to be better than that. Okay, so here uh, the thing explo explodes exponentially fast, but uh, in principle, uh, uh, 
nothing prevents it. To, uh, it's not reasonable that it, 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 it doesn't explode with time, especially because this is completely general. Here, if you see, we haven't even used the fact that we have only one, uh, one uh, zero for the reaction term. So we didn't use the reaction term at all. So this is the, uh, this theorem holds in in a very great general. And, and the constants AD of n. So here you see and, and, and alpha zero. So what is alpha zero? So alpha zero is alpha. Remember that alpha was lambda divided by V times rho. So alpha zero is actually lambda divided. So it's, it's, the, it's the worst case scenario. So this rho, this, this, this rho actually depends on time. So you can take the minimum, the minimum value of rho. Okay, so you start with some density maybe. Uh, uh, 1.0.1, and then you grow to 0 0.3, and then the minimum is 0 0.1. Maybe you started with 0 0.6, and then you go down to 0 0.2. So the, then the, the minimum is 0 0.2. Okay. So this this is the value, basically the value of alpha, and the so so here I. How much time do I have? I still have 20 minutes left. That's a lot of time. So maybe I went too fast. I have a question. Yeah, yes, please. So the equality you wrote down, you said P equals zero. Then the right hand side is the much bigger approximation. And you always assume that, sorry, take that question back. So H naught is always bigger than alpha or A, B, and N. Yeah, yeah, no. No, no, no. It's just that, uh, of course, if when you solve the, the differential equa uh, equation, you get some exponential ct minus one at some multiplying some terms that I just didn't, I, I threw away because uh, the formula looks, uh, uh, I don't know, because I wanted to. <laughs> yes, yes. So in the end, did you really need to look at the, the convolution. Oh. So um, in the computation, you use this convolution kernel. Yeah. But is it just a computation trick that makes life easier? Or did you actually need it? OK, so it's uh, both things, actually. So the, um, so in our original proof, Okay, let me put it in another way. So this is the proof in the case on which the, the profile is, uh, is constant in time, it's constant in space. If the profile is not constant in space, you can still do the proof, but then you will need to do this renormalization trick. Then you really need to do renormalization in the sense that uh, you get this R and the, the bounds that you get are not good enough for that R. So you take R of R and that's it. Okay, so in that case, you have to do it twice. So when we, when we originally proved this result, we didn't use this trick. And because we didn't use this trick, the number of renormalizations were uh, of order log n. And so it's not really needed, but, uh, but it, it, it really simplifies a lot the... Oh, okay, and does this number change with the dimension? Like, is it easier in some dimensions? Which number? Uh, the number of renormalize, the number of times you need to iterate that procedure. No, no, it's not uh, dimension dependent. I think in, in, in our first uh, draft, it was the, well, there, there was maybe a D in front of the log N, but uh, also there's not really uh, a lot of the, Dependence on the dimension. So, okay. So now let me tell you why this is actually a really good estimate. Okay. Because uh, you may hear one, it's always possible about, uh, well, is this estimate good? Does, is, is this estimate useful? Is the best you can do? Is the best possible. So let me discuss a little bit about that. So 
the first thing, so the, since I have a little bit more time, is, is that I'm going to show you that uh, actually this, um, this, this entropy estimate gives you a quantitative uh, hydrodynamic limit. Okay, so it proves this convergence of this, uh, to, the, of, uh, to the solution of the PDE in a quantitative way. Okay, so uh, let me define the following thing. So this is what people call the empirical measure, which is a very reasonable object. So one way to define the density of particles, which is, uh, it's, it's just to give to each particle mass one over n, or one over n to the d in the case of the d-dimensional lattice. And then what you do here is that you take the value of sigma t at time t, and you put a test function. Okay, so this is just the integral of the function f with respect to this sum of deltas where the particles are. Okay, so this is what people call the empirical measure. And now let me define the same thing, but with rho. So in principle, this guy could depend on t, no? But uh, well, in, in this particular case, uh, I, it, it didn't depend on t, but um, you still um, can make it depend on t if you want to. I also, uh, sorry, on x. Um, and of course, now let me define the center guy as the difference of these two guys. Notice that at this level, I don't really know if this guy here is the expectation of this guy. So I'm centering around something that should be close to the mean, but not exactly the mean. And then what you can see is the following. No? So you can uh, compute the following. So let's compute the following. So the expectation of this guy squared. OK? So using. The, the entropy inequality, this is less or equal than one over gamma h of t plus log of the integral of e to the gamma pi bar and t of f square d mu t. And now, you see that uh, here, these are centered Bernoulli random variables. So again, I can take gamma, so I can divide this by the variance, the, by the variance, no? And the variance of this guy here, so the variance, the variance of pi tf, with respect to mu t is actually equals to what? So it's the variance of the of, of the nulli, which is rho one minus rho. There is an n over d. And then you have the sum of that of, of, of the of the f guys. Okay, so uh, let me call just the f squared infinity. So if, if, if you're really lazy, you can put just the, the, the supremum norm there. Uh, and if you're more picky, you can call that L2 sub N norm or something. Doesn't, uh, but anyway, uh, it's not really important that uh, the point is that this is the variance. Therefore, here I can take this guy as the square of the variance. Right? Because this is like a Gaussian. And this Gaussian has a small variance. So it means that here, I can multiply by a bit bigger guy. So I can take uh, this gamma here as equal to the standard deviation, actually. So if I do that, I get here. How does, how does it go? It's, it's the variance, it's the square of the variance. It's, I, no, it's the variance. It's, it's actually the variance, right? Yes. So you get this, OK? A n divided by n to the d. Okay, so this is less or equal than a constant that depends on t, the norm of f squared divided by n squared. 
for example, for D bigger than three, okay? So um, for, D equal, for D equals one, you get N, which is the best possible, right? Because um, uh, we know that the, we know that you are, you are really close to, to product measure. For d equals two, you get n with a square. Uh, you get n squared times square root of log n. So we are square root of log n of the best possible scenario. And in dimensions bigger than three, we get well, we get n squared, which is not that bad, not that good, but not that bad, uh, but pretty, actually pretty good. Okay, so so this is what we call quantitative hydrodynamics. Okay. And this is uh, this is really new. Okay, so in the theory of hydrodynamic limits, uh, there is uh, people always prove uh, this thing converts to the solution of this PDE. But in this convergence, most of the time there is no uh, a speed of convergence. There is there, there is not an, 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 a concrete estimate. Sometimes there are uh, estimates that you get for depending, depending on the model you are looking at, sometimes because of uh, some of the uh, combinatorics that you have in your model, you can do it, but uh, in, not in general. So this is basically the first general uh, result that proves quantitative hydrodynamics. I, well, here I had to take, I, I probably had to quote uh, uh, Otto and co-auto. I don't remember the, 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 the co-autors there was was this guy which I forgot uh, was this other guy that I will never write correctly well you can put that you can do that no so recently they uh, they prove um, also uh, quantitative hydrodynamics okay so they for for uh, for different type of models so for G, for what is something that is called the Gismula dial model but the in, in their approach uh, things are much more complicated because uh, so the, the key word is logs of level inequality. Okay, so when you have the logs of level inequality, you can do better things. But uh, here we 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 make a, we put a lot of effort in explicitly making no use of the so-called logs of level inequality because that makes things more much more difficult because logs of level inequality is difficult to prove for uh, Markov chains in general. Well, sometimes you have it and then, then you can use it, of course. Uh, so, so, so that's the first thing. So you see that uh, now we get an explicit rate of convergence on the uh, hydrodynamic limit for this family of interacting particle systems. And that was something that was uh, basically open in the literature for a long time. So using a lot of could you get a better estimate or just the best? So for example, the yeah. uh, that's my next comment. So now I want to argue that this is the best you can do. Okay. So, so this is a, a little bit of publicity. Oh, well, another uh, another uh, observation. This is related with this observation about quantitative hydrodynamics. So before our work, the, the it was known that the, the the that the limit of the entropy divided by n to the d converge to zero with no with no rate of convergence there so that, that was the best result the, the best available result so we went to little o of nd to big o of nd minus two so it's a, it's, it's really it's, it's a really big improvement and in dimension one we get big o of one which is really a lot because uh, to to say that a system of dimension two to the n has finite relative entropy with respect to, to another guy is really to, is really a very, very strong statement. Um, so of course, in dimension one is the best possible because you cannot be better than big O of one. To this, to these measures, of course, maybe uh, you know something more about your measures and you can do better. Uh, but, uh, I want to argue that this is the best possible, and this is related to what I'm going to tell you tomorrow. Okay, because up to here, so let me see here. Okay, so up to here, this is what we I, 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 what I proved. Okay, so tomorrow 
I, I, I already told you that the, that we, we didn't use logs of level inequality. So if we do use logs of level inequality here, we can get rid of the exponential term because we can cancel now the entropy with the energy. So uh, if, if things go well, you will get, a, a, instead of having a positive constant in front of the, of the H, you will have a negative constant in front of the H at, at the right-hand side. And if, if you are able to do that, then you get actually convergence. Well, not convergence, but you, you, you get a, 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 a bound which is uniform in time. If you have a bound which is uniform in time, then you can be more ambitious and try to access the stationary state. And this is something we, we can do. We can, now this is for the, for, yeah, for tomorrow. We can prove that the, uh, 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 an actual, actually we can prove a CLT, a central limit theorem for the, for the non-equilibrium stationary state of these reaction diffusion models. And in this central limit theorem, we, we have access to the covariance. And you can, you, and you can show that in the limit, uh, these are the right orders of the entropy. So we can show that the stationary state, uh, the, the non equilibrium stationary state, has a well defined uh, limit at the level of CLT. And at the level of the CLT, the entropy between that a regularized version of that guy with the same, uh, how do they call it here, ultraviolet cutoff, no, with the same one over n, compared with the with white noise regularized over scales of one over n, is of that order. Okay, so. This means that it is the best you can do. You cannot do better because the actual, the, 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 the limit satisfies these bounds. Okay. It's not a proof that you cannot do better, but it's a very, very compelling argument because it, it will be very strange that uh, the entropy remains smaller. And all of a sudden, when you are at uh, times of more than 3 million, uh, it takes a big jump to, to make these things match. Right, because because you have a limit and then entropy is uh, is lower semi continuous, so you cannot converge to something smaller. No. Anyway, it's not a complete argument, but it's I think it's a it's a, it's a very compelling argument to, to 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 say that you cannot do much better. No? In the limit, the non stationary the non equilibrium stationary state. Uh, satisfies this bound, so uh, there's no reason to believe. I got, I got confused. So you have the exponential in T. Did I understand correctly that you can get rid of that? By yes. So what happens? Then you get more. But so when you say you can't do better, that doesn't. That's not the T dependence. That's the N dependence. The N dependence. The T dependence. You can do better. Yeah, maybe yes, but uh, well. It's, yeah, yeah, but the end dependence is the right one in principle. Because for the non equilibrium stationary state, uh, that's the, the end dependence. Okay, so I think, okay, that's all my time is over. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Milton, for a very interesting talk. Are there any further questions? Yes. Just to come back to the time thing. Um, so you can get rid of the E thing. Do you think you can get anything that's like, when you get rid of it, is it something that's gonna be global in time or is it still like, you need like a compact sort of time interval? Okay, so if we use the so-called logs of living inequality, we can get rid of the, we can get something that's global in time. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, and at this level of generality, you don't expect it to be uh, global in time, because, for example, this theorem applies for the case in which you have uh, two zeros for the reaction term. And in the case of the two zeros of the reaction term, you expect that the obvious that non the, the, the non equilibrium stationary state has infinite uh, very big entropy with respect to the product measure. It has nothing to do with the product measure. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Milton again.